If you walk off a 10-story building, gravity will introduce itself to you very, very quickly when you fall to the ground. Welcome to Life of a Siso. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's edition of Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole is in the house. Always a pleasure to be with you. It's one of my favorite, favorite times where we get to talk about my favorite favorite subject, really multiple favorite subjects. We get to talk about cybersecurity. We get to talk about being world-class. We get to talk about chief information security officer. And if we put it all together, you have Life of a CISO, which is focused on one single objective, and that's to make you world-class CISO. So happy new year, right? We, depending on when you're listening to this, we are uh, starting a new year, new excitement, new adventures. As many of you know, on the one hand, yes, it's a new year, but on the other hand, it doesn't matter, right? Because you should have goals, you should have objectives, you should have purpose, you should have focus. And whether it's the first of uh, month of the year, the third, the sixth, the ninth, who cares, right? It's just a date on the calendar. Get started. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, right? It's time to be world class. So just a couple of quick questions, just checking in with you. I know some of you have been listening to me for a while. So this is sort of checking in for the new folks. It's just sort of a a reality check. In the last 30 days, how many videos have you produced and have you put out? Let's just pause for a second. World-class CISOs are thought leaders. We are experts sharing information and in many cases, pioneering the way and helping others understand and solve complex problems. So if you are a world-class CISO, then you produce content. You produce content. It doesn't have to be 30-minute videos like me. It could be uh, two or three-minute videos. I recommend everyone start by doing it daily for at least 90 days. You might've taken some of my challenge where I do uh, two videos a day for 60 days, right? There's different variations of it. The point is it all comes down to the same, which is you need to consistently produce content. I produce my show, Life of a CISO, on a weekly basis. Do you know how many episodes I've missed since I've started? Zero, right? Zero episodes. Last year, we produced 52 episodes because I believe there were 52 weeks. I'll have to check if it was a leap year or not. If not, we got that too, right? So, so we're covered that. But the point is you need to get disciplined and focused in producing content. And you might say, but Eric, you're doing once a week. Why do you want us to do daily? Because habits that are not done consistently on a regular daily basis are hard to maintain. Now, if you tell me once a month, you can consistently do it, that's fine, or once a week. But here's my question for you. If you're just producing videos once a month, how much of a thought leader is that? How much are you really influencing or changing people out there? Right, so I like to start daily. If you wanna do weekly, that's fine. But the point is, you need to be on a very consistent schedule of producing and putting content out there. So that's first. Second, how many books have you read in the last 30 days? Cover to cover, right? You start the book and you finish the book, right? That's also a good check because guess what? World-class CISOs learn and expand their knowledge. The two go together. Right, reading expands knowledge so you can share new thoughts and new ideas with others. So those two sort of go hand in hand. And here's a pretty cool concept. And some people have been very, very successful with this. 
read a chapter in a book a day and then create a video on it, right? That's, that, that's super helpful because people are always looking for different ideas, different perspectives, and different ways of thinking about things. So even if you're taking somebody else's books that's out there, right, that's still really, really good. And you know some of sort of the, the core, core foundational books that I recommend all world-class CISOs to read, and if you haven't, definitely, definitely start with them, is Blue Ocean Strategy, right? Understanding business and how to uniquely identify opportunities. The second one is Play Bigger, which is all about becoming a category king. And then the third one is Principles by Ray Dalio, which is all about getting your mindset straight about your principles, how you behave, and non-negotiables, and how you work and operate. So those are great. Now, now I'll be honest with you. Depending on when you read, the, those are what I call more in-depth intellectual reads. So I typically do those in the morning, right? I'm more of a morning person. So, so that's sort of my morning reading in the evening, I like to read before I go to bed, but those I'm focused a little bit more on the, the higher level, the motivation, those types of things. Uh, right now, I'm rereading uh, Ryan Holiday's Stoic series. Uh, the Obstacle is the Way is the first one. Uh, ego is the Enemy. Uh, still, silence, uh, stillness and silence or, or uh, something along the lines of being still and silent is power is, is his third one. So I'm reading that series. Also, I love the, uh, the secret series. Uh, I, I'm picture, picturing her face. I can't remember her, her name right now, but, but the secret, the movie, the secret that it was based on, ba basically uh, Law of Attraction. Uh, she has four or five books that are really, really good. Grant Cardone, he has several books, uh, The 10X Principle, If You're Not First, You're Last. I mean, great, great authors out there that you can just start reading and start picking up and read cover to cover. And once again, discipline. Go in and read for 30 minutes a day or 45 minutes a day or a chapter. The, the reason I'm not as in favor of a chapter is I'm very big on scheduling and chapters can be five minutes. <coughs> they can be 20 minutes. They can be uh, 60 minutes. So it, it's, it's harder to schedule. But if you just say, I'm going to read 30 minutes, right? That's a little easier to be able to schedule in. But those are two key habits that if you don't have reading and it doesn't have to be on cybersecurity, most of you know cybersecurity really well, right? You got that. You, you live it, you do it, you have it. But it's the business and mindset and those other areas you need to work on. And then you need to be a thought leader where you need to share that content. So producing consistent content. I like videos. If you prefer writing, you can do blog posts. You can do little mini articles on LinkedIn, whatever it is, but you need to post content out there. Those are the two. And I'll give you a bonus. If you look at all successful people, they have several things in common. And one of them is they read. I mentioned that. Many of them produce content. We mentioned that. But can anyone guess what the third one is that all successful people do? And if you know me, right, and you know where I am at 5.30 every morning, you could guess this one. Exercise, exercise, exercise. One of the best things for health for mental sanity, which in hopefully 2022 is better than the last two years, right? But, but uh, if there's anything the world needs is some mental sanity, right? Uh, exercise, exercise, exercise is the best thing for that. So go to the gym, get in some exercise. I, I switch it up right now. I'm doing more weightlifting. I enjoy that right now. I'm doing uh, some different weight exercises, uh, working on meeting some goals and objectives with muscle growth along those lines. Then I'll go in and I'll do some sauna. I'll do some ice bath 
and just some meditation and basically get myself ready for the day. So I'm in the office ready to go at 7.30 and I meet my team. Uh, most of them arrive between 7.30 and 8 in the morning and we rock and we roll and we have an awesome day. So th those are three things that world-class CISOs, in my opinion, pay attention to. Just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you want to become a world-class CISO. So start building those habits. Exercise, reading books, and thought leadership. What I really want to cover, I sort of just wanted to check in with you on that piece, but what I really wanted to cover today is just, let's get a little grounded. What does a world class CISO do? What is really a chief information security officer? Because I hear this all the time where people go, Eric, I'm applying to CISO jobs, but either the description or what they want in the interview is not a CISO position. So we need to recognize that many companies and even many individuals have basically misutilized the term and not use it correctly. A CISO is a business leader focused on cybersecurity strategy to enable the business to be successful. That is what a CISO is. A CISO is not a technical position. A CISO is not a promotion for a world-class security engineer that's been at your company for 14 years that you do not want to lose. A CISO is not the most senior security engineer in your organization. Those are security engineers. Those are technical positions, but that is not a CISO. And that is why many companies are struggling in cybersecurity. They're failing in cybersecurity because the problem with having a world-class security engineer or a world-class technical security person as a CISO is their life, their language, their communication, and their obsession is on technical solutions. The problem is executives don't care and they don't want to know about technical solutions. They don't speak technical language. So what you get in most organizations and the reason why we see all these breaches and issues and everything else happening is because you have this one group, executives, that are very, very concerned about cybersecurity, but they don't know anything about it you have this very, very sharp technical group that knows technology, knows security solutions, but they don't really know or speak business. And you put them in the room and it's equivalent to somebody who's only fluent in Germany, in German, and someone who's only fluent in English. And you put them in a room and expect, expect them to communicate. They're gonna try, they're gonna smile, they're going to try to point to things, but eventually what happens? They both get frustrated, they both get annoyed, and they give up and they just stop trying to communicate. And that is what happened in, happens in most companies today. The communication barrier is gone. A CISO, now just so we're clear, because I always get people that go, Eric, I disagree with you. They go, Eric, you're wrong. A CISO needs to understand technology. Yes but you didn't hear what I said. A CISO's primary role is a business executive that understands and puts together a cybersecurity strategy to enable the business to be successful. In order to do that, they need to know technology, they need to speak technology, and they need to communicate with the technical team, but that can't be their primary focus. And that's what people miss. I'm not saying that CISO shouldn't have some technical knowledge and shouldn't be able to speak technology. They absolutely do. What I'm saying is that can't be the primary focus. To use my analogy, a world-class CISO is bilingual. They speak business, they speak technical, 
and they know which way to translate. So when they're with the executive team in the boardroom, they are translating technical to business and only speaking business language. Then they take that information they get and they go to their technical security team. And because they speak technical, all they do is speak technical. They take all of the business and they translate it to technical and technology and speak that to their team. That's world-class CISO. You need to have both pieces and be very, very comfortable in both of those areas. First, communication. So if we really look at the most critical skill of a CISO, it's communication. So let, let's break down some of that core communication. The first thing that a world-class CISO communicates to the executives is this. In any functional environment where there's a running business with technology, 100% security doesn't exist. You cannot be 100% secure if you have technology and functionality. And the reason is quite simple. The only way to achieve 100% security is zero functionality. That's the only way. So I joke. So yes, I have some clients that go, Eric, we want to be 100% secure. I said, great. We're going to relocate the company to Pennsylvania and we are now going to be an Amish company. We're going to do horse and buggies. We're going to do candlelight. No computers, no cell phones, no electricity. Then from a business standpoint, maybe, then maybe can we start talking about 100% security. But in any realistic sense of the world, word, we need to recognize it's not going to happen. So the law of security, just like the law of gravity, I sometimes get people to go, Eric, I, I don't know if I agree with your law of security. I'm like, does it matter? You can tell me, Eric, I don't think I agree with law of gravity. I, I just don't believe in it. I think it's a bunch of hoax. But guess what? If you walk off a 10-story building, gravity will introduce itself to you very, very quickly when you fall to the ground, right? Whether you believe it or not, the law of gravity is always at play. And the law of security is always at play, which is this. Whenever you add or increase functionality, you are decreasing security or increasing risk. It's really that simple. So that is the first thing that world-class CISOs do. Every one of my clients that I work with, every one of the board of directors that I represent and I speak to and I present to, they know that they are not 100% secure. They know that there are risks that they are accepting, and that is a necessary part of running a business. The mistake that is made in security, and this is done by technical folks because technical folks want to be 100% secure. They'll spend every last penny securing the organization. CISOs recognize there's a balance and there has to be acceptable risks in place to do that. So we need to go in and say, listen, there are going to be some risks. And, and it's okay, but we need to go in and knowingly accept what they are. So here's what world-class SOs do. They train executives to ask additional questions when making a decision. Most executives in most businesses, when they're making a decision, they ask one question. What is the value and benefit? So we're rolling out a new server. What is the value and benefit? It can make things easier for our customers. It can increase customer satisfaction. Wow, that sounds really good. Do it. We're rolling out a new server with all this critical data. What's the value and benefit? It can increase our profitability by 30% and increase our revenue by 20%. Wow, that sounds awesome. Do it. Here's the problem. You're making a lopsided decision because you don't have all the information. 
The additional questions are this. First question, keep asking, what is the value and benefit? Because there is no value and benefit. Why are you doing it? The second question, what is the risk and exposure? What is the risk or exposure by doing this? And then the decision is simple. Is the value or benefit worth the risk or exposure? If the value and benefit is worth the risk or exposure, do it. If it's not, don't. The mistake that's often made in security is we think security is a binary decision that's the same for every organization. I always have people go, Eric, I bet you're going to tell me I shouldn't do this in the name of security. And they ask me a question. I'm like, no, I said, let me ask you a question. What value or benefit do you get from doing that? What is the overall risk or exposure from doing that? And is the benefit worth the risk or exposure? In order to grow a business, you have to take risks, right? There's some entities that are very aggressive in risk. And there are some organizations that are very risk averse and that's okay. And when you're coming in or getting hired as a CISO, you need to know that. And you need to adjust your risk tolerance based on the risk tolerance of the business. Here's the issue though. And I just had this with a client. The company had a CISO that was very, very risk adverse. And you had a company executive team that was very, very aggressive in risk. So what would happen is they would try to do things and essentially the CISO would stand in front of the train and say, we're not starting it. And I normally don't like to do this, but in that particular case, I'm like, listen, the CISO is stopping your progress because the CISO is not a CISO. The CISO is a security engineer that doesn't want to accept any risk. And all this person wanted was spend more, spend more, spend more on security and eliminate every risk, which isn't possible and isn't practical. So that's what happens when you get into a situation where you put a technical person as a CISO. So it's important to recognize that cybersecurity is not a one size fits all. CISOs need to understand what is the tolerance of the organization, what is the value and benefit. And yes, there are some times where you need to take some risks in cybersecurity based on potential value or benefit. But here's the important part. It must be with full awareness. The example I like to use is I like extreme sports. I like to do base jumping and those things. To me, it's simple. You, you've probably, if you've listened to my recordings or know me or met me, uh, I, I, I got some weird stuff going on up here, right? So, and, and those are going, oh yeah, right? So this is always racing, right? It's always going, it's always racing, it's always thinking, uh, which is good. But it's sometimes nice to disconnect. And when I do extreme sports, like jumping off a mountain and free falling, for a while before you pull the chute, it is so intense and exhilarating that essentially I can shut this off, right? So I can just enjoy the moment, clarity, focus, right? It's basically like slow motion where everything stops. And if you're looking at me right now going, you're nuts, that's okay, many people do. Uh, I sometimes look at myself and stays the same. So we probably wouldn't argue over that. But the point is I love it and I enjoy it. However, it is very risky. I know that. I know that people die every year and I know that potentially I could get hurt or injured. However, I am fully aware of the risks, but to me, the value and benefit outweighs those risks. So therefore, to me, it's worth it to take it. <clears throat> now, I have a friend of mine, <clears throat> a Steve, and we were watching Point Break not the original Keanu Reeves Point Break, but the newer one uh, that came out where it was essentially the Freedom Fighters or the, the uh, Okana 7, oh, whatever that was, the Okana 7 where they were doing uh, these crazy feats and they were doing base jumping and all that other stuff. And he always loves watching that movie and he's like, oh, I want to do that, I want to do that. I'm like, really? 
I'm like, let's go. So we planned the trip. And we spend almost four hours hiking up the mountain and we get to the top of the mountain. And we're at the top of the mountain and we're getting our gear ready and we're getting ready to go. And he sort of, he's like look, look, looking out over the mound. He's, he's looking down a little bit. He's looking at me. He's like, dude, man, th th this looks a little crazy. I'm like, yeah. He's like, this looks like if I don't listen to you and if I don't do something correctly, I could potentially die. I'm like, yes, absolutely. That is true. And, and, and as we talk, he is starting to consider the risk. He never did. He just saw the coolness. Right? He only asked the first question, what is the coolness? What is the, the benefit? What is the value? He never asked the second question. And as we're up there and he starts asking the second question and realizing just how risky it is, he decides differently than me that, you know something? I can watch movies. Me actually doing it, the value and benefit is not worth the risk or exposure. So we walk down the mountain. I'm not going to push anybody in. And I'll tell you the worst thing in, in those cases is to operate from a place of fear. It's, that, that's when you make mistakes. And once again, it was he requested it. And I, I love hiking, so I had no problem. We hiked back down the mountain. But the point is, my friend Steve, is how many companies approach security. They only look at the value and benefit. They only look at the coolness. They only look at the revenue and the profits. And they do things. And then... After they get breached or broken into, they're like, wait a second. I didn't realize how risky it was. So world-class CISOs do that up front. World-class CISOs recognize that you can actually have proper security, but it's not going to be 100%. And on those lines of accurate, valid communication, the other thing that world-class CISOs need to do is accurately explain what's happening in the land of cybersecurity. If you look at the major breaches that have happened over the last 18 months, in my professional opinion, I worked on many of them. I spent a lot of time researching them. They were all preventable or detectable. To me, none of them were really, truly crazy, advanced threats that there was nothing you could do about them and there was nothing you could do to prevent, detect, or deal with those. I think what vendors are pushing are very biased. A great example is after SolarWinds comes out, you have these big security vendors who, who come in, come in, let's, should we say, actually failed to do their jobs, right? Shh, 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 don't, 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 don't say that, right? Because they didn't deal with it and they got breached and broken into, which is okay because everyone is going to. So I'm not criticizing that at all. But instead of saying, yes, we made a mistake, these attacks we could have done a better job with, they decided to do the narrative and Congress and the White House is getting on board with this narrative, which is very, very dangerous, which is, this is the most advanced attack we've ever seen. I don't know if you read it, but one of the big vendors said, in our opinion, this was the most advanced attack we've ever seen. This would have taken a thousand programmers, a thousand years to create this exploit because it's so advanced. And then I always laugh because I raise my hand and say, okay, explain in detail how the attack worked. And they're like, oh, Eric, we don't know. We're still investigating it. You don't know how the attack worked. You're still investigating it. But how do you then know that it took a thousand programmers a thousand years? You can't have it both ways, right? If you know how the attack worked with such confidence that you're going to go publicly on the media and say, it took a thousand programmers a thousand years, then tell us exactly how you came to that conclusion. But if you say you don't know how they got in and you don't know how the compromise worked, then how can you say that? And then I love, and then this part you never heard about, but Five, six months later, they identify the root cause of solar winds, and it was an intern that set up an administrative account with an easy-to-guess password. Last time I checked, cracking passwords doesn't take 
a thousand programmers a thousand years, right? So, so we have this weird thing going on where we have these vendors and the media and the news sort of playing that there's these advanced attacks that you can't do anything about. And you know, I mean, you, you just game over, cybersecurity is a zero sum game. You can't win, you can't do anything about it. And in my opinion, it's a bunch of you know what, right? It's a bunch of BS, right? Not realistic, world-class CISOs speak the truth. World-class CISOs go in and tell the executives, listen, this is what happened at a high level, and these attacks are preventable, and here's what we need to do to minimize the damage to our organization. And the final proof is simple. If managing risk was zero sum, which means no matter what you do, you're going to lose, if that was a true statement, insurance companies would have went out of business a long time ago. The fact that insurance companies are essentially recession-proof and make money year after year regardless of the economy shows you that if you understand and manage risk correctly, you can win. And that's what world-class CISOs do. World-class CISOs understand and know how to manage risk. You're not always going to get it right. So sometimes breaches will happen, but you as a world-class CISO will contain and control the damage. And that's the message that you need to portray to your executives. World-class CISOs are world-class communicators speaking the truth, understanding risk and explaining it in a way that executives can understand and take appropriate action on. I hope you enjoyed this week's edition of Life of a CISO. Please keep listening and I hope these keep advancing your career. But if you want to accelerate this, if you're like, Eric, I love this content. I love what you're saying. I want to take my career to the next level. I have a six month CISO certification. It's 40 hours of knowledge transfer, six months of coaching with me, yours truly, and a private peer group. And everybody who's gone through it says the same thing. Best investment they ever spent, worth every penny. And it basically, in six months, accomplished what would normally have taken them two or three years. So if you want to keep watching Life of a CISO and sort of do the slow track, awesome. I'm here to help. I'm here to support you. But if you want to put some rocket fuel in that engine and take it to the next level, go to secure-anchor.com slash CISO or just send me an email, ecole at secure-anchor.com and I'd love to have someone from my team get back to you. Otherwise, have an awesome, awesome week and I'll see you next week.